Okay, do you see my screen? Perfectly, yes. And you see my mouse as well? Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so thank you. Uh, so I'm going to uh, change a little bit the topic because we are going to discuss about uh, host pathogen interactions this time, but still, of course, with a lot of uh, imaging involved. And this time it will be uh, a model of viral infection and particularly the interest we have in the um, when infections go into the central nervous system. And so uh, the objective of this work is to try to better understand what's going on during an infection of the brain and spinal cord with a long-term objective of trying to limit uh, the sequelae uh, that happens after uh, a neonatal viral uh, encephalitis, which is still relatively common, uh, not only in developing, but also in, develop, in developed countries, for example, with viruses uh, such as uh, herpes simplex. So uh, among the questions that uh, are asked is how do viruses would cross the blood brain barrier to invade the CNS? And then what happens uh, during the host response? Because we know that there are trade-offs. You need a host response in the brain to prevent the virus from propagating. But we also know that it has its own uh, deleterious uh, aspects. So we want to understand the kind of trade-offs that are involved there. And also, why do those infection, infections typically persist longer uh, in the CNS as they would in periphery quite often? And for that, we're going to use the zebrafish larva, uh, which, as you know, is a model which is used extensively at the larval stage. Uh, well, the, the zebrafish is used mostly at the larval stage because it is still transparent uh, at this stage. Uh, and it already has an uh, innate immune system which is in place with uh, macrophages, neutrophils, a lot of cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF, uh, IL-1 beta, uh, and also in our case, type 1 interference. And also the blood band barrier uh, has started to be put in place. Uh, but it's also a stage where you don't yet have adaptive immunity, no T cells, no antibodies. So you can study this innate uh, immunity independently, which is really the vertebrate type in it, in immunity independently of the more, more complex uh, adaptive immunity that takes more time to set up. Just regarding those, uh, this innate immune response uh, for viruses, the important cytokines as a type 1 interference. And so uh, just to briefly mention them, we know that there are four type 1 interference uh, in the zebrafish, which we characterize uh, and the receptors with the George uh, some years ago already. Uh, and interestingly, you have two different families with two different receptors in the fish, which is a bit different from what you find in humans, where there is uh, all type 1 interference uh, bind to only one single receptor. But there is a second family known as type 3 interference, the interferon lambda, which have a different receptor. So somehow it may be some kind of convergent evolution. And uh, I'm not going to discuss that in detail. The pathways that are induced are fairly conserved. And uh, the genes, the downstream genes, there is also some very significant uh, uh, conservations that I'm not going to discuss here. What I just want to mention that those uh, type 1 interference, there are key antiviral cytokines. If you take a mouse which lacks uh, type 1 interferon receptors, it's extremely sensitive to uh, almost all viruses. Uh, and it's also true uh, in the fish. So, and we did those experiments uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, by after having identified those receptors, we could use morpholinos to knock down their, ex, uh, their expression with uh, very little impact on development if you choose the proper chains. And then if you infect with a virus, uh, in that case, it was chikungunya virus, uh, we could uh, show that we had a much stronger infection in those uh, morphine fish and also that they would die while normally they uh, controlled uh, this uh, infection. So uh, chikungunya virus was quite important, uh, clinically speaking, but it was also hard to work with. And so we switched to uh, another virus of the same family, also an alpha virus, which is called Synbis virus. So uh, this is a type alpha virus. Uh, and actually it's a virus that whose natural host is birds, but it can also infect humans, but only giving a mild fever. So it's a BSL-2 virus, which makes it much more convenient than chikungunya, which is level three. Uh, it's a positive strand RNA virus, which is transmitted by mosquitoes. Uh, 
which is interesting for zebrafish work because it means that it's already naturally adapted to a wide temperature range and uh, it can infect mosquito cells at a typical uh, zebrafish temperature of 28 degrees. Uh, it has been used a lot as a model uh, of a virus that causes encephalo uh, encephalopathy in mice, as do other alpha viruses. Uh, and also its reverse genetics are relatively simple. Uh, the genome contains two big open reading frames, one which corresponds to the early expressed non-structural proteins, another one corresponding to the late structural proteins, and um, all of the uh, viruses I'm going to show, the recombinant ones, will have uh, their fluorescent viruses co-expressed with these late genes. So you will see the cells becoming fluorescent when they are already making capsid and envelope at relatively late stages and when they are also making new variants. So actually, we showed uh, already with uh, uh, Gabriella Passoni, who was a PhD student in the previous uh, in, in, um, innovative training network, that this virus was neuroinvasive in zebrafish. This time, we were using one of those virus with a GFP put in the three prime uh, UTR of the virus. And uh, what we could see that if we infected uh, a fish, a zebrafish, uh, intravenously with this virus, you would get a lot of cells infected and many places in the periphery. And then you would see a bit later uh, infections in the brain, for example, it, but it was quite viable. And uh, Gabriela was able to image uh, and follow those infections. So this, these are transgenic fish where all neurons, there expressed RFP. And you have the infection uh, labeled with GFP starting there in the brainstem, well, in many other places as well in the periphery, but you see in the brain, it starts in the brainstem. And from there, it propagated, for example, there to the optic tectum becoming more and more important. Uh, also, she could really show that neurons were infected, as this is an example of a, a labeling of the uh, trigeminal ganglion, and you can see axon, which also contains the GFP. And uh, this is another case. This is now uh, uh, muscle infected, and there are cells in the spinal cord, and we have a co-labeling with GFP and with an anti-capsid, showing the presence of the virus in the soma, but also probably in some, uh, well, also capsid at least in the dendrites. Or, uh... So uh, with Gabriela, we show that uh, Silvis enters the central nervous system by axonal transport. I'm not going to deal with that. This is published. Uh, so uh, we could exclude most of the routes where, which have been described for viruses to enter uh, the uh, central nervous system, such as through olfactory route by crossing the blood-brain barrier or by using macrophages as Trojan horses. And actually what was left was the axonal transport where you have a peripheral nerve taking the virus somehow and then bringing it uh, via the axon up to the uh, central nervous system. And uh, one very strong clue was that, for example, when we could see some uh, muscle cells being infected, which you can recognize as a typical uh, shape there in the tail of the fish, uh, if you now uh, take new images of the same fish, in that case, it's again neurons, which are uh, they are shown in magenta, you would see that one day later, you would have cells from the spinal cord with a neuron connect with an axon connecting them to the muscle. And then after uh, one more day, the muscle cells, uh, infected muscle cells have died, but you have remaining infection in the uh, spinal cord. Uh, and actually, uh, we could show that experimentally, that if you inject the virus in the retina, then you would get very strong infection in the contralateral optic tectum, which, because of the optic chiasma, uh, really shows that this is mediated by axonal transport and not by leakage or any, anything else. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, move to the uh, new work, which is still uh, unpublished and still work in progress, because actually uh, most of the, uh, our work in the past year has been devoted to trying to establish a SARS-CoV-2 model uh, of infection in zebrafish, uh, but I'm not going to discuss that at all. So uh, the first student that we had in the uh, frame of the Image in Life project was Ludovico Maggi, uh, and among the things he did, for example, was to uh, demonstrate that there was a bottleneck when you have the transfer from periphery to central nervous system. Uh, like in that case, so we had new versions, improved versions of the virus, where this time the fluorescent protein is uh, in frame with a capsid and envelope, so you cannot uh, e easily lose it by mutations. Uh, and uh, if you co-inject two different viruses with two different colors, you get multicolor infection in the periphery, 
But then if you wait one day uh, for longer, you would then have this infection going into the central nervous system. And typically it will be single color, really showing that there is this bottleneck, which, is, which has been found uh, in mammals for, with other viruses, not, any, not anything particularly uh, surprising, but which were really expected in this kind of uh, model. So then this project was taken up by uh, Valerio Laghi, uh, who is still working now in the lab uh, and will, uh, I hope, soon, soon uh, get his PhD um, based on all that work and uh, the SARS-CoV-2 work, which I was discussing uh, also. And Valerio has been testing a lot of different sites of injection, particularly to understand how the virus would propagate from organ to organ. So, for example, uh, he did some injections, so the intravenous injections, which I was discussing before. So, each time you see the same larva, uh, one day, two days, three days, four days after the infection. And these are just examples. So, uh, if you do the infection IV, you have something which is fairly viable. But if you do intramuscular injection in the tail, then you have something which is much more consistent with uh, then invasion of the spinal cord. And if you do infection in the pericardial cavity, then you have infection of the muscles around the jaw, and then you have infection of the brainstem. And of course, you can also inject the virus directly in the spinal cord, and you get this very strong uh, labeling from the start. It's interesting how they exclude each other, the two clones, but that's not something I'm going to discuss. And then it propagates to the brain, as you can see there. So now the question was, what are the cells which were involved really in the entrance? And we were strongly suspecting motor neurons. Uh, we were working there on the uh, uh, intramuscular to spinal cord system because it's better for imaging. It's relatively flat, not, not too thick. Uh, so we got a line uh, where uh, bottle neurons were labeled in green from Sora Nashura, as you imagine, and we infected with a Synbis and Cherry. And then we did time lapse. And of course, so the, the, the fish is growing there. <laughs> so Abaleo has, uh, has solved this issue uh, since there uh, to, to better follow that, but you can still follow what happens here. So you see this very first cell, which is a neuron infected near the, the spinal cord. But actually, if you look better, you will see that this cell is not in the spinal cord, but near the spinal cord and has its own axon, which is not that of motor neurons labeled here. And actually, uh, these cells are not motor, this cell is not a motor neuron, but it's a sensory neuron, which is located in one dorsal root ganglion. And uh, we used, sorry, so we now uh, use another line provided by Sorana, where, which is a neurogenin 1 GFP, which labels uh, particularly those uh, cells in the dorsal root ganglia. And we can really, saw that, really see that these cells got infected. And also, we did some experiments where we did selective depletion of either uh, neurons on the dorsal root ganglia using a, a morpholino against ARBB3B, or depleting motor neurons using the uh, natural reductase metronidazole uh, system. And we can see that in that case, a final infection of the brain was really uh, uh, dependent on the fact that there were sensory neurons, but not motor neurons. So those sensory neurons play a key role in CNS entry and then propagation uh, to the brain in the future. Also in that case, uh, we also saw, got finally some infection of the spinal cord itself, but no uh, more propagation. And we think that something very similar happens in the entire part via the trigeminal and the vagal ganglion, by the way. Uh, so in those movies, we can also uh, really look at what, uh, where the, uh, how was the virus propagating in the spinal cord. And we saw a very typical jump and burst progression. So you have a first set of in infection with just a few cells, and then you see that this will increase. And then you see some focus appearing at a distance and then others even at a distance, and then these grow, each, each of them. So which really shows that you have, again, in the spinal cord, axonal transfer at a distance. And then around this infected neuron, you will see uh, propagation. And it's not clear for the moment if it's just a diffusion of free virus infecting the neighboring cells or uh, dendritic connections, uh, closed dendritic connections of those internal neurons between them. So uh, Valerio developed a pipeline to, do, to perform quantitative analysis of the infection based on imaging, particularly with the objective to uh, quantify separately the infection in the periphery and in the central nervous system, uh, 
uh, using a system with masks and also removing the yolk, uh, which can be very bright at some times and give parasite image. And so uh, he could get very uh, reproductive data showing that in the periphery, you have a transient infection, which is really what we knew before, but was not quantified before, with a peak between uh, 24 and 48 hours, and then it decreases while you have a, a much uh, stronger progression, uh, stable progression in the central nervous system with some fish where then it will grow uh, and kill the fish while in others it will be controlled. And also uh, you could show that uh, this quantification by imaging was really very well correlated to another measurement using QRT-PCR on the whole larvae, for example, showing that it's really a valid way to uh, have an idea of uh, the amount of infection you get. And then uh, he also confirmed the key role for the type 1 interferon uh, system in the resistance to CIMB. So again, this is a survival after infection of uh, fish made deficient for the receptors of type 1 interference, and they would die in about three, two to three days. And if you image those fish, then you will see that they have, so those are uh, interferon receptors morphons, those are controls at two different times. And you will see that in that case, the uh, difference would be much stronger actually in the periphery than it will be in the central nervous system, but there is also stronger infection of the central nervous system. So based on that, we uh, built uh, a model uh, to try to uh, understand this infection using a two compartment model, a simple system, where you would have the periphery and the central nervous system. And uh, assuming that you have the blood brain barrier in between, that is going to prevent a passage of uh, proteins such as type 1 interference and viruses, which are of course bigger. Uh, but there is one way by which the virus may enter, which would be then those sensory neurons. So this is a representation of one of those dorsal wood uh, uh, neurons. And then you would have some cells which would then uh, get infected, which are uh, both in the periphery and centrally because they have a, a ending at both places. And each compartment then will be modeled in the same way with uh, having uh, target cells that can be infected by refivirus and then become first for some time what is called the eclipse cell, where the uh, cell is, contains a uh, virus genome but is not producing new variants yet. And then after some time, it goes to the producively infected stage, infected stage where it's making structural proteins and producing new virus. So those cells would produce virus. Uh, and then you would have production of type 1 interferon, uh, which would be either by detection of uh, virus genome in eclipse cells or by free uh, viruses by sentinel cells. And this type 1 interferon would prevent infection of target cells, may prevent uh, uh, progression from eclipse to productive, and can also induce or accelerate the death of those infected cells, the cytopathic death of those cells. So this is a relatively classical model. So sometimes there are some uh, uh, re uh, uh, resistant uh, compartment added for the one which have received the interference system, but this is um, something which is relatively classical. And so we fitted the model. And in that case, because we have all those imaging, we can have a much more direct access to many of the parameters using for those models that people that do modeling in uh, primates or in horses, which has been used ponies a lot for, for influenza, for example. And for example, we know from imaging that after inoculation, you need seven hours to reach, uh, to have the first producibly infected cells. And we estimated that it's two hours to get to eclipse and then five hours for productive. We know also that producibly infected cells survive for about 24 hours. This is deduced from chikungunya mostly, but we can, uh, we need, need to confirm that we've seen this. We estimated the virus half-life and the interferon half-life. And then what we knew is that, for example, if you inject uh, a dose of 30 to 100 variants, and if you don't have an interferon response, the larvae would die in two to three days. And then taking uh, in account those parameters, if we just, one key parameter was the amount of virus produced. And it was actually to get to this proper stage uh, timing, we need to have a relatively low amount of variants, surprisingly low, uh, only three or four uh, variants per cell and per hour. But of course, that's uh, new, usually we consider that cells produce more viruses, but we don't know how many are really infective in this uh, part. And also depend on the efficiency of the cells to infect other cells. Uh, 
And so uh, there we assume that this is all uh, well shaked uh, and mixed, which is not uh, really the case. What we know also that if you have proper interference system, we should have a peak in periphery between 24 and 48 hours. And that at this peak, we will get something like no more than 1% of infected cells. And from that, we did use the other parameters of the way the interference system was working. And this is the kind of uh, then uh, pattern you get. So without interference response, you would see a loss of target cells in uh, one day and a half, and then the eclipse cells would disappear as well. And then we assume that the fish would die. In that case, you would reach a plateau quite fast at, it, between one and two days, and then uh, it will stabilize. And then a bit later, the interference response would stabilize as well. And this uh, corresponds uh, relatively well to what we see when we do qPCR for the interference system. Uh, and we saw that the best fit was if we assume that the interference would prevent infection and also would accelerate the death of infected cells. Now, can we use this uh, same system to, for the uh, CNS compartment? Uh, so, which in that case, as you know, the interferon is not crossing the BBB, so you have no interferon at the time of entry, no virus either, uh, just one cell, which is this dorsal root ganglion. And what you see that, in fact, you cannot choose the same parameters because if you use this system, whatever, and even if you have more cells, you would always get a rapidly self-limiting infection. So you need to have something different happening there. The interference response has to be less efficient. And in particular, uh, one hypothesis, which is quite reasonable, is that you don't want to have the neurons dying. So the interference system, the interference may protect the neurons, but is not going to induce the accelerated death of those infected neurons. And also we know from imaging data, which are, we are currently accumulating, that the uh, interference response is delayed in the central nervous system. We're using this uh, MXA m cherry reporter. So MXA is one of the genes induced by type 1 interference. So that's a uh, transgene produced by George uh, initially. And so you can see that you have a very uh, a strong response to the periphery as uh, early as day two, actually, even, even before. Uh, but in the central nervous system, it takes much longer to that before you can really detect these responses. Like you have at day four, there are these infections in the brain. Uh, and it takes, uh, but you don't have a really detectable response at this stage, while you would get it much later. We also saw that uh, infection is going to induce invasion of the spinal cord by macrophages. At this stage, you do not have yet macroglia inside the spinal cord, but if you have uh, actually infected cells in the spinal cord, then you would see macrophages coming in using this, again, uh, rep macrophage reporter. And these are just the projections in Y and Z showing that they are really inside uh, the spinal cord, those cells. And we think that they enter via the holes led uh, by uh, dying axons of infected cells. So I'm going to stop here. So this is, as I told you, this is a work in progress. So we know that we have a system which is quite powerful to study the host viral dynamics. And that the virus invades the central nervous system typically via a few sensory neurons. And we have an infection in the periphery which is transient because of the strong interference response. And that it's quite different what happens is a CNS uh, because uh, probably because of the uh, differential in fact, impact of survival of the cells. So we have a lot of questions that are left, left uh, uh, unanswered. Uh, one of the things which was quite surprising in the model is that there are like 10 times more cells in eclipse phase than productively infected ones. Uh, which I really did not expect. So we need to verify this. We now have a virus reporting the early infected phase where well, we can verify this. We, we, we need to check if the neurons, how long do neurons survive? And uh, then how do they survive that long? And we have an int, it may be due to autophagy. Uh, so one thing we wanted to do, and we have not been able to do lastly, uh, largely because of the uh, lockdown, was to uh, extend our uh, model to cell-to-cell uh, -cell, uh, propagation uh, with uh, all the help of the network. So I hope we can do that later. We want to understand what are the source of type 1 interference inside the CNS, for example, those macrophages that we see entering, to understand what are the neuronal behavioral defects that you have with the infection, and uh, what are the adverse effects exactly that those type 1 interference have the central nervous system, and if we can find some component of the response which could protect, protect without having this kind of uh, adverse effects. And with that, I just want to uh, thank the people that did this work, so particularly uh, Valerio, uh, 
and uh, also people from my group. So Emma, Laurent, and our animal uh, caretaker, uh, Johan, and uh, many other people, uh, collaborators, former, uh, former members of the lab, uh, people in the virology department, uh, Georges uh, for the transgenes uh, and the network and everything, uh, our collaborator, Jeremy, for the modeling, uh, people in the Institute Imagine uh, for the uh, neuronal lines, uh, and I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Jean-Pierre, uh, for this talk on these uh, beautiful images of infected zebrafish. I'm always impressed. Um, do you really think that macrophages could use the, the, the holes left by the, the, the axons of, of, died, uh, of dead uh, uh, neurons to, to, to get within the spinal cord? It's so very small. Uh, yeah, it's very small, but actually, so you, you see that uh, when you do time lapse, we have cases where we saw those axons that started to de degenerate and macrophages that really seem to be using this pathway. And this has been described also in models of uh, injury, when people uh, would use a laser to ablate those axons. And then you have the axon with degenerate, and then you will have macrophages that will uh, be attracted uh, at those sites. Uh, and promote, in that case, regeneration. So I think that's really possible, yes. And, and why do you suspect macrophages to do that rather than neutrophils or, or other, other migrating cells that, that are attracted to uh, inflammatory sites? Well, we have done uh, more imaging of uh, macrophage reporters than neutrophil reporters, but from what we saw, uh, Unless you really have a super strong infection, you don't have neutrophils entering the CNS. They really need okay. to have a very strong infection to be affected there. You know, normally they are excluded from the CNS. Okay, thank you. <laughs>